keep moving I keep singing you keep bringing me the victory hallelujah there's honey in the rock so sweet in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know the same the Lord Jesus, Jesus, fresh 
in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise Glory to God. Hallelujah. Man, the more I sing that one, the more I love it. Because it says everything to us about our relationship with God. You know, no matter what's going on in our life, how crummy it is, how good it is. We can always sing that song and, and it brings us back to what's real and true. And that is our faith in Jesus Christ, no matter what. He will never let us down. He will never leave us or forsake us. He said, he promised us that. No matter how far down we feel, no matter how burdened down we feel. Amen. And so that's something that we can take to the bank and believe God for every day of our life, just to trust in Jesus.
take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Comfort with the Lord of Pan. Precious Savior. Still our refuge Take it To the Lord in prayer Do thy friends Despise Forsake you Take it to the Lord in Blessed Savior, you have promised you will all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be free all to be in earnest You know, it's interesting because the Lord said he'd never leave us nor forsake us, but he never said he wouldn't test us. He never said that we wouldn't go through trials and tribulations. I think sometimes we forget that. And we think that, well, you know, why are we suffering or why are we going through this stuff? When God's, you know, said that he, he would never leave us or forsake us. And then Peter tells us in the first Peter 4, 12 that. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial that has come upon you as though something strange. Were happening to you. But rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of his glory. Now, there's a difference between the Lord leaving us and the Lord testing us. Amen. Now, Peter, he understood this. He's writing this 
out of a personal life experience that he had. Remember, Peter was considered the most boisterous and bold of all of the disciples. He was called perpetuous, which means one that runs ahead, one that really doesn't take any time to reflect. He just, he's a reactor. He reacts in the second, in the moment. Peter was considered a leader amongst the disciples. But he was also the, the disciple that probably broke the, 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 the heart of our Lord and Savior more than any other. And that's something that, you know, we forget when we think of Peter, the rock. In Matthew 26, 69 through 75, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it before them saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were, with, who were there, this fellow also is with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. I don't even know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are, the, are one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus, who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you would deny me three times. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. One translation says that Peter... After he denied the Lord the third time, he looked over and saw Jesus looking at him, and, 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 and then he began to weep. He wept because he denied the Lord. He wept because in a moment of fear and in a moment of testing and trial, his faith crumbled. Now, this wasn't the only time that Peter's faith crumbled. When he was on the boat that was about ready to capsize, and go down and Jesus was all of a sudden appeared on the water and he's walking towards the disciples and he calls out to Peter and says come out on the water and Peter was at first hesitant he didn't want to do it he was afraid but because the Lord was the one speaking to him he got out of the boat and he began to walk on the waves of the water but the Bible says for a split second, he looked away from Jesus. And as soon as he turned his eyes away from the Lord, he began to sink. And in this moment where Peter was, was being accused of being with Jesus, which would have meant that if had Peter been arrested, he would have probably been killed as well. But he was afraid. I want to say tonight that there are periods of our Christian life where we will be tested by our Lord. Our faithfulness, our dedication to him will be tested. As was Peter's. And we, we will have an opportunity To understand what it means to trust the Lord in the darkness. It's easy to trust him in the light, isn't it? It's easy to trust God when the spirit's moving. When you're hearing God speak to you in a worship service. Or when you're reading the Bible and you're getting comfort or strength from it. It's easy to trust the Lord then. But when darkness comes. When the shadows come. When you're in a moment of doubt. And, and, and don't think it can't happen to us. John the Baptist 
John the Baptist, when we think of him, what do we think of? We think of a strong man, a man of God, don't we? We think of someone that is a rock that is that is never going to doubt. Now, when John was in prison, after John the Baptist had been arrested and thrown in prison, he no doubt entered into a period of darkness wherein the shadows were coming, closing in. John was sentenced to death to be executed by beheading. No doubt his faith was at its weakest point that, it, that he had ever been. He never probably knew a moment like this in his life. Now when John heard while in prison what Christ was doing, he sent a message to his disciples and asked him, are you the one to come or should we expect someone else? Now, see, this is this is a question that John already knew the answer to, because earlier in his ministry, John said of Jesus, behold, the Lamb of God who takes the sin out of the world. He knew Jesus was the Lamb. He had already seen that. He baptized him in the water. He saw the dove coming out of heaven on him. He saw the miracles Jesus was doing. He knew it was Jesus. Well, what caused him to doubt was the very thing that can cause us to doubt tonight. And it's the darkness that comes upon us in those moments of trial. You may be going through a darkness in your life right now. You may be going through a period of doubt. And that happens to every single child of God. That's why Peter said, don't think it's strange. Don't, don't let the devil tell you that you're, you're a rotten person or that you're some weirdo because you're having doubt. That is not the case. I want you to hear the response of our Lord to John's doubt. And Jesus replied to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk with... Those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor are told the good news. And blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. As these men were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A, a reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. I want you to see the response of Jesus wasn't to tear John down. He didn't scold him or discipline him in his words. He didn't say, oh, how dare you doubt me, John. What does he do? He reaffirms John as a great prophet, as the prophet sent from God, as a voice in the wilderness. He said, what did you go out to see? A reed shaking in the wind. In other words, he fortified John. You see that? John had a momentary lapse of judgment. He had a momentary lapse of, 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 of faith. But it didn't it didn't define who John was. 
It didn't capsulize John's whole ministry of life. It didn't take away the good things that John had done, the, the voice crying in the wilderness, the baptisms and the repentance and all that was done. It didn't nullify that. You see, the devil wants to nullify and tear people down. He wants to destroy their ministry, destroy their credibility, destroy their walk with God. That's the devil's aim and goal. But the trial isn't to destroy us. The trial is to make us greater. The trial is to make us stronger. You don't put gold in the fire to destroy it. You put gold in the fire to refine it. You don't put gold in the fire to nullify it. You put gold in the fire to purify it. And that's why we're tested. That's why we're tried to make us stronger, to make us more purified, to make us more settled in our understanding of who the Savior is, of who the Lord is, and to understand that he is with us no matter what. John was in prison. His life was hanging in the balance. But in that moment, the Lord verified John, clarified John's position and who he was. Doubt is a weird thing. The kind of doubt that Satan sows into our mind, it's, a, it's not even real. It's not even really a doubt on our part. It's a satanic confusion. It's a demonic uh, fog that comes upon us in a moment of weakness. It's that momentary lapse of judgment, that momentary lapse of faith that can come upon us like a whirlwind out of hell, like a storm out of hell. And we have to be able to understand it and perceive it for what it is. I don't know how many times in my life I've doubted God, not purposefully, not willingly or intentionally. And it can come about in many ways. Life can deal you a blow so severe that you all of a sudden begin to feel discouragement. You begin to feel depression. You begin to feel all of these emotions. And sometimes these emotions, they're just human emotions, not necessarily satanic or demonic. Uh, I used to... People used to tell me when I first became a, a minister and I began to preach a lot on Sundays and, and I would preach like all over different places and travel and preach and speak. And, and then Monday would roll around and, and they used to say to me, you're going to feel um, a letdown on Monday. You, you had a high on Sunday. Maybe you went and preached and people got saved or you had a great meeting at church and, and you feel good. And then Monday comes along and there's that letdown. And all of a sudden that letdown can lead to discouragement, doubt, and all kinds of feelings and emotions. And they used to say, don't make any decisions, rash decisions on Monday. How many preachers quit on Monday because they are discouraged, because they feel like their their ministries aren't a, amounting to anything, and they feel the, the guilt and, and, and shame of, of failure what seems to be what we think is failure sometimes god says it isn't failure at all john was discouraged he was despondent he questioned that what was happening was it really jesus was it really god i don't know how many preachers have done that Lord, is it really you? Are you really moving? Are you really doing anything? Is, is this amounting to anything? And what did the Lord say? Are the, are the blind seeing? Are the deaf hearing? Are the, are the dead raised? Are the poor hearing the gospel? See, see what he was saying was, don't, don't look at just the negative. Don't just look at the bad things. Look at the things that I've done. And you know, when David, King David was fighting for his life, he was coming into his anointed kingship and Saul wanted him dead. 
and he he hunted David down like a like an animal, and his his aim was to kill David. But the Lord had put his hand on David and raised him up to be king of Israel. As David was king and he was coming into his kingship and he was fighting these battles. He came into one of the battles in an, in an area called Ziklag. And as he came into Ziklag. After going off and fighting all of these other battles, as he came back into that area that he had he had uh, buried uh, barrack, uh, he had barracks and, and his um, men of war were there. That was their kind of like their 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 home base. And as he came back there and he looked around and he saw bodies laying everywhere, devastation, of fires, and, and and human life lost, friends and family members lost. The Bible says that David sat down and he wept. He was discouraged. And who wouldn't be? But then the Bible says David remembered. All the things the Lord had done for him. And the Bible says something that's very key. When we're in trials. When we're in the darkness. In the shadows of, of temptation. It says that David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He encouraged himself. That means he lifted himself up off the ground and he said, wait a minute. Remember when God did this? Remember when I was a shepherd boy and, and God gave me a, a slingshot and, and a few rocks and I killed that bear. Remember when I slayed that giant called Goliath? Remember when all of these things, he began to get encouraged in the Lord. And that's what the devil tries to do. He tries to reduce us down to nothing. He tries to bring us down to such doubt that we cannot see the victories. And I've done that. I have done that in my Christian life, in my ministry. I remember when God called me to pastor the small church. And it was in, in a very affluent area. The houses were, some of them were like million dollar mansions. And I was discouraged because I was like, God, these people aren't going to hear the gospel. They got everything they need. And I was discouraged. And then one day we did this thing in the park. We had this little park in the town that I pastored in was Oxford, Michigan. And that was the town that had the school shooting a couple of years back. It made national news. Interesting. That was the town that I pastored in. And there was a little park in the middle of town. It was an old village in, in Michigan, an old village town old buildings, you know, very, a lot of character, very nice little, little area. And the downtown had, you know, some apartments and it was the only area probably in that whole section that had some, I would say people that were not affluent, that were more poor and that had, uh, you know, needs, physical needs as well. So we did this thing where we started this, uh, we had a, I had a, a, a few people from my church and we did a puppet ministry thing out in the middle of the park for children and we just had you know we, we gave them we gave away food and clothing and different things and, and and you know out of the midst of that discouragement out of the midst of everything that i was feeling this this feeling of it plagued me day and night this feeling that i wasn't made i wasn't doing anything i wasn't i wasn't reaching people for christ all of a sudden people were coming and, the, and their kids were coming to church and the, the parents, some of them were on drugs and we started to communicate with them and connect with them. We started to minister to these families and pretty soon I started to see the Lord started to work. And I just remember all the things that the Lord had done in my life. And I did what David did. I encouraged myself in the Lord. I picked myself back up off the ground and I said, that's it. I'm going to believe God. 
He said he would never leave me nor forsake me. He'd never fail me. He would never leave me. So if he's not going to leave me, I'm not going to leave him. I'm not going to doubt him. I'm not going to. I'm going to believe him. And so we have to understand, first of all, what is Satan's aim? What's his end game in testing us? It's to shut us down. It's to shut us down and take away our faith and our trust in God. That's simple, but it's more complex than that because when it's happening in the moment, you don't understand that because you're clouded in your understanding. The only thing that I believe we can do in those moments is praise and worship the Lord. To get away from everyone and everything and shut ourselves in with God and cry out to the Lord. And the Bible tells us that when Satan magnifies our problems, when Satan magnifies our doubts and our fears, that is when God will come and will magnify his name. He'll magnify his power his authority, his glory. God will shine down on us. And I lived for probably two, three years in that church. Where I never saw anything at all that was good. I only saw the negative. It wasn't until I left that church that I started to hear about all the things that God was doing. Because I was so caught up in the doubt, so caught up in the discouragement. I mean, and there's a time for us to feel in the part of the of this is understanding how much of this is the Lord showing us something that we need to be grieving about. Maybe people aren't getting saved. And the Bible says, he that goes forth bearing precious seed, weeping, weeping, shall doubtless come again, bringing in the sheaves. The sheaves are the wheat. The wheat represents the people, the lost souls. Bringing them in means they're getting saved. So when that happens, there's got to be the tears to water the ground or the seed in order for there to be the, the, the fruit of the harvest. That's the process of God. So how much of that is God stirring us up to pray, to believe him, and tears are a way in which God does it. That's one, one thing. And that's something that we need. We need to be stirred up. The Bible said Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the people, that they were like sheep without a shepherd. And that's the compassion is the love of God for lost humanity. And we should have that in our hearts. But there's a difference between that and the condemnation of the devil. There's a difference between that and what happened to Peter and what happened to John. That's demonic. That's satanic. And that will lead us to just to to uh, um, where. Um, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver and then went out and Bible says after the devil got a hold of him and, and possessed him, he went out and hung himself. Now, I know a lot of people in the ministry, they didn't go out and, and get a rope and hang themselves, but they sure did hang themselves because they left the ministry. They got discouraged. They gave up. And the reason they gave up, because they didn't understand what I'm telling you tonight. They didn't understand this. There's a difference between God stirring us up, 
breaking our hearts for lost people and, and us having a burden. And if we're not seeing people saved, that should con concern us. That should make us feel discouraged. We should want people to be saved no matter what. But again, I say there's a difference between that and the spirit of giving up. When I was in the ministry, I was very early in, in my ministry. I began to understand this. I would get out of nowhere. This dark feeling would come over me. And I would feel like. I wasn't anything, and I knew I wasn't anything, but I mean, it wasn't like, you know, oh, Lord, I'm nothing, you know. It was more like the devil was telling me you are nothing. You're never going to amount to anything. God's not with you. You might as well give up. I mean, I've been hearing that all of the time. Along that time, I, I had a, uh, an, an associate, an acquaintance, in, in, in another church in my town in my city I didn't know the I didn't know him that well I knew of him and he was working with youth and I remember that one day I I got um this this is before email and 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 texting and all of that so it was um it must have been, it was a phone call or something that somebody had called me and I, I don't remember if it was a phone call or if I was at a minister's meeting and I heard but I heard that this this young married man had committed suicide and I was I was shocked I was shocked because again, not knowing him, I didn't have any signs of anything. I didn't know him well enough to know the signs or what to look for. And I don't know all the details of why he, he hung himself. But I know that that is Satan's end goal is to destroy. And then there was one other guy that when I was in Bible college, that he was somebody that I knew well. He hung out with us all the time. Whenever we would go to prayer or, or go out and do street ministry or go to dinner, he was always with us. And I had no sign at all that he was depressed, discouraged. We all went home for Christmas. And Christmas is a very hard time. For anyone that's struggling with depression, especially if you're alone, if you don't have family and whatnot, it can be very devastating. Now, I don't know what his personal life was or his situation, but all I know is when we came back from college, I mean, from our from our homes and went, we came back to college from Christmas break. We got the news that, that he had he had committed suicide. And, you know, the devil he's a liar the bible says he's a father of lies lies are the devil's thing that's what he does but when he lies to us he knows how to lie in such a way to make us believe it he's very convincing after all he convinced eve to sin in the garden he convinced her to disobey God. And it's not something that we should focus on for very long, but when the enemy comes in and he tries to tear us down, you got to remember there's times which God allows us to go through the trials. But what God is looking at and what God is doing in that moment is much different than what Satan is trying to do. And the one thing that we can look at in the scripture and, and, and we can kind of get an understanding 
of this process. It's the potter and the clay. Now, I have not been involved in pottery, never, never made pottery a day in my life. Had a grandma that made all kinds of pottery, things of that nature. But as I did some research on making pottery, one of the things that was revealed to me is that the clay, the potter will start working on it and he'll get it into a shape in which he likes. But then as he, as it begins to, the heat comes off and it begins to cool, he starts to see the imperfections. He starts to see things that he doesn't like. So what does he do? He takes it in its hardened state and he breaks it. And he starts all over again until he gets it the way he wants it. In Jeremiah, there's a scripture that says that the Lord is the potter and we're the clay. And God said the clay was marred. The word marred means disfigured. It was the same description given of Jesus' face after he was beaten at the cross of Calvary. He was marred, Isaiah said, more than any man. His face was irreconcilable. You couldn't recognize him. And the word marred is used there. And it means blemish, sin, imperfection. God's purpose for testing us is not to destroy us. But it is to perfect us. It is to make us more like him. It's to make us more like Jesus. It's to make us stronger, greater, better than we've ever been. And that's the purpose. That's why God allows us to be tested. When Peter went through that denial of Christ, it made him better than he ever was. Because before that, he was... He was cocky and self-assured but it was coming from himself it was coming from peter but after he denied the lord and he saw that what was in his heart that he wasn't anywhere near ready to follow christ he threw himself on the mercy of christ and it was in that moment that that he had humbled himself In, in such a way that when Jesus asked him, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Before, Peter would have said, yes, Lord, I will die for you. I'll go to the ends of the earth for you. I'll go to prison for you. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Lord. I love you. There was no pride, there was no boasting, there was no arrogance. It was a simple yes. That was the response of someone that had gone through the trials and had come out the other end better, stronger, and greater. And Peter was asked by the Lord three times, do you love me? And all three times, Peter said, yes. And in the last time, Peter said, Lord, thou knowest all things. You know whether or not I love you. In other words, I don't need to prove it anymore, Lord. I don't need to go out and, and, and say I'm going gonna, uh, gonna to die for you. I'm going to go to prison for you, but then fail in a moment of weakness. He says, I'm just going to rely on the fact that you know I love you. And that my faith is enough. And that's what the Lord is doing. He's bringing us to a place. 
when we say we love him, it's coming from the depths of our heart and not from our mind or not just from some, you know, something we learned in Sunday school or, or whatever, but it's coming from an experience. Whereas you were tried in the fire and you were made as gold tried in the fire perfected purified what made peter able to stand up on the day of pentecost in front of thousands and thousands of jews who had come to jerusalem to worship the feast of the harvest what made peter so bold that he was able to stand up and preach. It was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. That came upon him. And he was able. Boldly. Now that boldness. You want to, I want you to see the difference. That boldness wasn't coming from Peter. Anymore. But it was coming from the Lord. That boldness, that assurance, that ability to say, yes, I love you, Lord, without a doubt. It was coming from a deeper place. It was coming from a deeper well. It was coming from the Holy Spirit. It was coming from the power of God. And the last thing I want to say on this is that we have a person <coughs> who has been sent by Jesus to help us. His name's the Holy Spirit, and he's God. He's the third person of the Trinity. And Jesus said he will, he will comfort you. He will not leave you, nor will he forsake you. He will help you. And when we get to that point that we understand this, our Christian life changes. Because it's no longer us trying to please God in the flesh. Peter understood that in his flesh dwelleth no good thing. Peter understood if he could deny the Lord that easily. Then the only thing he could do was throw himself at the mercy of God. And he did. In the rest of Peter's life. He never ever denied the Lord again. And Jesus said to Peter, one day, Peter, somebody will take you. By the hand. And they'll lead you in a place that you don't want to go. The Bible said this was, Jesus was speaking of Peter's death, which he should die. For being a, a follower of Jesus Christ. See, he was going to die, but his time to die hadn't come yet. But there would be a day when he would be martyred. And historians tell us he was crucified on a cross. Upside down. Now, that tells me something. That the trial prepared Jesus. I mean, Peter. It, pre it prepared him for his whole life. It made him what he was. The trial that he went through, the crucible, was that which made him better and stronger and greater. And it doesn't make any sense to us in the in the in the when we think about it with our natural mind, does it? 
well, how does failing make us better? That I don't understand. Usually failure makes us worse. But it's 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 that paradox, they call it. A paradox. When something opposite happens than what you would normally think. The cross was a paradox. How could a man dying on the cross save anyone when he can't even save himself? Because we understand that he was resurrected from the dead. That's a paradox. How can our failing, like Peter's failure, made Peter stronger? How can that happen? Because God is able to take us and show us through the failure how we failed and how we can be strong again. And that's what Peter learned. That's what we all need to learn tonight is how our failure doesn't have to define us. It doesn't have to make it the end for us. And I say that tonight to every minister, every pastor that failed, every pastor that have, has thoughts of quitting and ending their ministry, every pastor that has been tempted, tried, tested to give up and throw away everything. It's not worth it. Throw yourself at the at the mercy seat. Throw yourself at the feet of Jesus. And cling to him for all your worth and God will raise you up. The Bible said in due time, God will raise you up. Resist the devil. Submit to God and he will flee from you. It's interesting that Peter writes his letters from personal experience. When he says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Amen. I'm sorry, that's James that wrote that. But Peter talks about, I'm gonna try, I'm, I know the one scripture. I'll find it. First Peter 5, 8, there it is. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Peter could write that, amen, because he had experienced the devil as a roaring lion. He could write that because he experienced it in life. It's interesting to me that life experience is the best experience of all. You could read that scripture a million times, but until you experience that scripture, until you experience the devil coming at you as a roaring lion, you don't understand it. It's just a text, it's just a verse. Amen. So Peter writes two things and many more things in his letters. He's instructing people.
as someone that has understood it from both sides of the equation, he understands it from the side of failure, but he also understands it from the side of victory. What makes him able to share that was because he got victory. He overcame his defeat and failure and was able to then be raised up by God in a mightier way to serve the Lord. And so everyone that has failed, everyone that has struggled, understand that the Bible is filled with failures all the way through it. In fact, every person that's ever walked in shoe leather has failed. Did you know that? The Bible said there is not one that's righteous. No, not one. Everyone has failed that's ever come along. David failed. Samuel failed. Everyone failed. Everybody. The whole entire lot of humanity has failed. That puts us in pretty good company tonight. <laughs> but the company that we need to be in is those of the redeemed. Those that have walked out of failure and into the victory. And I feel for those people out there tonight that feel that they cannot be redeemed or they that, that they've failed so many times that they can't be free. God can free you. God can deliver you. It doesn't matter how many times you failed because that failure isn't dependent. Whether you're good or bad, doesn't, that, that doesn't mean the means of how you are saved, delivered, or set free. It's by grace. It's by the grace of God. It's by faith. It's by putting your faith in God. That's the only thing we can give God tonight is our faith, is our trust. The leaning on him, that's it. Once you learn that, everything else will come together. And we have to learn it sooner or later. And God will keep putting us in the trial until we learn it. Oh, ye of little faith, Jesus said over and over in his school with the disciples. They were not learning as they should. They were struggling to understand. Their faith was weak. But Jesus didn't give up on them. No. He baptized them in the Holy Spirit and he gave them power. He gave them authority as he has given us. Amen. Lord, tonight I pray that you will be with anyone that hears this message and send this message out, Lord, to those that are struggling with discouragement tonight, those that are st struggling with depression, anxiety, and fear, those that are hurting, Lord, those that, that in the ministry that have been uh, a failure in, in the eyes of man, but God, they're not a failure in your eyes. Lord, bring those diamonds out of the rough and send them out into your work. Polish them. Put us in the fire, but help us, Lord, to be stronger than we've ever been. In Jesus' name, Lord, and send a mighty revival, Lord, to your church. Put us in the fire, of tribulation so that we can come out pure and holy and righteous before you lord and do a mighty work in this hour god as we continue to pray for revival as we continue to seek your face for an outpouring on the on the country across every state in this union a mighty outpouring of the spirit of god the churches would be on fire for god the churches would be anointed that lord you would light up the kingdom of God in, in this hour and bring forth your power against demonic spirits, all the enemies that are attacking, Lord, on every angle, on every front. We pray for deliverance. We pray for the supernatural strength of God upon those tonight that have felt discouraged and like giving up. Give them hope tonight, Lord. Give them faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Almighty God, we serve. Angels bow before Him, heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve!
before him. Demons run from him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. What a mighty God we serve. Hallelujah, Lord, we thank you that you're a mighty God tonight, Lord, and we pray for your power, your anointing, your blessing on this ministry, that it will continue to go into the darkness, and Lord, as we go on to you now and these other sites, anoint us, put us in favor and blessing, Lord, that we could go in and, and take the captives of the enemy and, and bring the gospel to the poor and the needy and those that need Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit, God, move in a mighty way. And we pray for those that, are, that have been with us for a long time that we haven't seen God move upon those that are, that are just aimless and not really doing anything for God. Draw them back, Lord, into your presence, into your spirit. And we ask in Jesus' name, Lord, all these things tonight. Amen and amen. All right, well, I'll get a hold of you this week. Maybe we can get together on, on you now or something and do some run some tests on it and see how it works. We can try to do a live, maybe, um, I don't know. We'll just figure it out. But all right, so I'll get a hold of you this week. And uh, other than that, we'll um, see you. Thanks for coming again. And um, I, I sent out to... Caleb, I don't know what is going on with, with him tonight or whatever. Um, I haven't seen Lashia and a lot of people really in a long time. So we're hoping that we can see a recovery of those people in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. God bless. We'll see you.